express gratitude for Alan's musicianship this morning. I am hoping you can all hear me. I'm going to do a quick gallery check. Do a thumbs up if you can hear me and it's not too echoey. How is it? Thumbs up works if you can. Thumbs down if you can't. I'm getting thumbs up. Okay, good, great. So welcome to Jackson Community Church on this Labor Day weekend. I want to first say thank you to Dan Weir for his presence the last two weeks while my family had what we called a staycation, but actually part of it was that our daughter Sarah was having a church version of her wedding right here in Jackson. And that was a delightful experience very intimate, but quite lovely. And um, it was wonderful to be here celebrating Sarah's and Mira's special milestone together. Just a couple of other messages or announcements for the life of the church. Next Sunday, we will be having a historic triangle commemorative service at eight o'clock over in the, the outdoor area that has been preserved for us by the Historical Society. So we invite you to come eight o'clock then if you want to get together outside. That will be in lieu of the pavilion service that we've been holding pretty regularly. And we probably will not do an in-person 915. Well, we might. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. I'll get down here and we'll do 915 too. Um, also, Wednesday of this week, Jeanette, do you want to give the details of how we're doing the Alzheimer's walk as a church? Sure. sure. So the weather looks good for Wednesday, and we're going to meet at 930 in the morning, and we're going to walk in Whitaker Woods. So meet at the parking lot off of Route 16, sort of opposite White Mountain Oil. And we'll take off from there. I've just printed some map. There's lots of trail options and you can walk as much or as little as you want, but it's to celebrate the Alzheimer's walk to raise funds to find a cure for Alzheimer's. Everybody's welcome. So we're going to meet at 915 and sort of start at 930. Is that right? That'd be great. Okay, great. So Whitaker Woods parking lot. Be there, be square, and if you can't join us walking somewhere, then feel free to sponsor us as we work on this very important cause that touches so many of our families and has taken the life of many of our wonderful congregation and community members. Those are the only announcements that I have right now for the Life Church except to, as always, thank Alan for his wonderful music. He arrived in time to share music with our 915 group, and there were a few of us gathered for worship and communion, and we got to savor his music at the end of that service. And it's nice to be back in the church and to be back with a live organ and a live piano. It's a different kind of challenge as we do the Zoom, um, as if any of you were here when we were experimenting with sound, but just to be together even a little bit in this space and celebrate our own space is wonderful. And we're glad that you're here even in this way with us. Then at this time, unless there are any other announcements and raise your hand right now, if you have an announcement that I didn't make already. Going once, going twice. Doo -doo -doo. I think we will prepare ourselves to center. So please just focus yourself and listen to Alan's music.
Thank you, Alan. One of the things I love is that when somebody different comes and helps us, like Dan Weir did last week, he tried a different perspective for how to set up Zoom in the sanctuary. So you get a slightly different view. I might still shift this a little bit, but I like what he did. Um, I like the perspective. You get to see some of the flowers. You get to see the fullness of the space. And I'm not right up in your face. So uh, thank you, Dan, for your creativity and looking at things in a different light and helping us look at them in a different way as well, both literally and figuratively. We move now in the service to the prayers of the people. If you have any prayers that you would like to raise, we, we will ask first for prayers of concern, followed by prayers of celebration. I ask you to include in your prayers the family of Gay Ramsey. She was a very dear friend to both Chris and I and our family. And I officiated at her memorial service yesterday, her funeral actually, um, at the request of her daughter who is a colleague of mine. And so please hold her family in the light. Her death was one of dignity and she died at home. She died in peace and she died in the care and the company of her family. And so we are grateful for the way that she passed out of this world as well. Are there other prayers for the life of this community? I'm going to switch us to gallery view so I can see everybody. I'll go, Reverend Gail. Okay, Kevin, I'd love to have you go. Okay. Prayer for you and Chris and for Jennifer Perkins and for my friend Tom, who has tremors in his hand, and, and his wife Judith, who had vertebrae surgery, that you'll heal. And prayer for my friend Rob, his wife has stage four lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And prayer for my friend Holly, her daughter has cerebral palsy. Prayer for her daughter. And um, prayer for the first responders. And prayer for my friend Max with his new marriage and prayer for my friend Bob and his family in New Mexico. I'm not sure there's anybody you didn't include in there, Kevin. You got almost <laughs> everybody. Any other prayers of concern that we would like to raise up as a community out loud? And look Say again, Alan. Father Steve. That's right. That's right. Alan raises up one of uh, my clergy colleagues, Father Steve, who serves Our Lady of the Mountains, but he is on extended leave to care for his parents. Uh, and his church deeply misses him because obviously we know times are unsettling enough, so not having your spiritual leader with you, but he needs to be with his family. And so we pray for the journey that they are all taking together and, and also for the well-being of the church while he's away and you have other leadership. And Alan is one of the spiritual and ministry leaders of that church. So we appreciate that you're present in multiple communities. Any other prayers of concern? I see Kit. Go ahead. I just a prayer for that. Uh, school goes well for the children going back to school this week and they all stay safe with this yeah. COVID. Prayers for the those that are returning to school, the students, the teachers, and all the other staff and families who are supporting this experience for all of our children of all ages up through college. Sue Kerrigan, I see you waving your fingers. Unmute. You're muted. I'm there you go. Um, I wish prayers for our friend Roland as he returned from hospital. And we just don't know what the future brings, but please keep him in your prayers. For our friend Roland, who's been in and out of the hospital and for his stability and well being and all that comes with that. Cindy, I saw you do you unmute. You have to unmute. 
Still can't hear you, Cindy. Do you want to, you can put it in the chat if you want, Cindy. Still can't hear, uh, I can't unmute you. When Cindy gets unmuted, we'll let, there we go. She's unmuted. You were unmuted, you were, you were. Not, but now we can't hear you again. You did it and undid it at the same time. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear. Explaining to my daughter who Roland was, because she knows Roland. Oh. Whose friend Roland? She asked who it was. Yeah, she asked me who it was, and I put my finger up. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Arden and Ray, were you trying to share with us? I can't hear you, Arden. If you're talking to us. <laughs> The art of navigating the, the, the microphone. Still can't hear you. All right. Well, Arden, jump in if you if you are able to join us and you want to add a prayer. Um, prayers of celebration. If anybody has one of those, please go ahead and share yours. Obviously, we are joyful for Sarah and Niru. Arden, do you want to jump in here? I'm trying to figure out why you're not hearing me. Do you hear me now? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I am very grateful for the wonderful summer that I had with my family here in stages. And um, I guess uh, I, I'm hoping for really good findings from this Alzheimer's walk hope that uh, I hope that it's going to be everything that we all are praying for. Thank you, Arden. So prayers of celebration for a good summer and prayers of hope for what efforts like the Alzheimer's walk may bring for the different conditions that we live with. Um, we also have a prayer of gratitude for Wendy and John's upcoming 55th wedding anniversary on Friday. I believe there might be a few birthdays in the house somewhere coming up here. So we might have to do some more birthdays. Admit it if you have a birthday, just raise your hand and wave it now. And Kev, let me just finish my thought, please. And then we have another prayer of celebration for Michael, who um, has done well with his stem cell transplant. And Roy wants to say something. Please go ahead, Roy. But, uh, speaking of anniversaries, Nancy and I are celebrating our 59th this week. <laughs> oh, you got four on done. Wow. I see some applause going on. <laughs> All that's in covenant. That's wonderful. Congratulations, Joy and Nancy. Okay, so we have both the anniversary and birthday songs to be singing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make you all sing. Kev, why don't you say what you want us to say for us? It's a. Uh, <laughs> it went away. The echo went away, I think. I hope. Um, Kevin, do you want to say what you wanted to pray for? Uh-oh, Kevin, maybe. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please, Kevin. I guess um, it's... Um, I think his connection's going in and out. All right, we're going to go for it. We're going to sing. So go ahead and mute yourself. I'm muting myself. Oh, no. I guess I can't mute myself. You go and play Happy Birthday Flash Happy Birthday. Alan's going to play for us, and we're all going to sing the okay? How's that sound? <laughs> Oh, 
Well, I'm celebrating that Tony is with us. I'm Thank glad you, that um, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, welcome back, Tony, to your home and to, to our community in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, well, and I commend everybody for their singing, and we're going to pray together now. So please join me in prayer. Oh, holy God, we give thanks. We give thanks for the ways that you move in our lives and you name us and you claim us and you show up as a love that will not be denied or turned away. A love that is tenacious and finds hope when it seems there is no hope at all. A love that is personal and intimate, but also communal and public. A love that embodies an entire world and every single beating heart and life within it. We ask you to be present in the communities that are hard pressed either by social unrest or by terrible climate and environmental catastrophes such as storms and floods and fires. We pray for all those that respond and try to create stability in these times. We ask for those that are pressed to make decisions as leaders of our towns and our counties, of our states and our nation and world leaders, that they will hear the voices of all people and see the importance and the dignity of the lives of all people and help to create solutions that will create not just safety and security, but meaningful change and meaningful equity for all people. We ask you to be with us as we gather in this worship today and we are inspired by your word and we hope that we are changed by what we hear here and that we carry it out into our lives. We ask for your blessing. Amen. Now, one thing I realized that I forgot to, to remind you about, so I'm just going to remind you right now, is that we're going to do communion today. So if you do not have communion elements, you are more than welcome to jump up and grab those before I read the scripture. So Alan, do you want to play us like a little ditty for a moment so people can go grab communion elements? So anything you want to grab, like a, a glass of water, or a cookie, or whatever you might need. We're just gonna give you 30 seconds of music. This is the beauty of a gifted musician who can just dive right in and give us improvisational music on the spur of the moment. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're going to begin this morning with the scripture. These are excerpts from the letter to the Romans written by Paul. You have already spent a couple of weeks inside this letter with Dan Weir, so we're going to do a sort of pull back and hear just excerpts from different parts of that letter and then think about the letter writing as its own act of faith and worship. Excerpts from the letter to Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. For I am longing to see you, so that I may share with you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you, or rather, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. 
both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I've been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as I have come among the rest of the Gentiles. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The commandments are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So ends the reading. And I want to think now about this book of Romans, which was not written as a book. It was written as a letter. And to think about the letter writer and the act of lighting the act of letter writing then and now. Think in your life, you know, we have a couple of really outstanding letter writers in our community. Cheryl Pizer, who keeps us all connected, and Tish Hanlon, who is also a wonderful letter writer for our community. Many of us don't have that habit, and so we, we write when we have very specific reasons, such as uh, somebody's birthday or their anniversary, the things we just sang about, or when we know that somebody has not been well, you know, Tony coming back out of the hospital might receive cards from us because we take the time and we, we write something down and we actually put a stamp on it. Those are not the kind of letters that Paul was writing. He was writing about occasions, but he wasn't writing about personal occasions and personal lives. He was writing about communal occasions and events. Paul preferred first to go himself to whatever was going on and be in the habit of face-to-face -face communication, but he helped to found multiple churches all over the Mediterranean and the Aegean. They were hundreds of miles apart, and he might spend months or years in a single community. Thus, sometimes he would send one of his compatriots, one of his companions, such as Timothy or Titus, or in this case, in the letter of Romans, he names Phoebe, a deacon from a church outside of Corinth, who he sent, entrusted with a letter to the community in Rome. And if he couldn't send a delegate, then he would send a letter. The letter was the third best way to communicate if he couldn't get there himself or he could not send a trusted person as a shepherd and a guide in his stead. And so this letter to Rome, much like the letters, all the other letters that have been collected, 
was written to a specific context, a very specific community about communal concerns as opposed to personal ones. And so I want us to back out and think, what kind of letter would you put your name to as an open letter to the community? How often do you write letters to the editor in the Conway Sun or write a letter that you would circulate in the Jackson E! News for everyone to read? Um, you know, what causes will move you to put your name and your voice to the work of transformation? Because typically, I think when we take the time to sit down and write, not to a corporation that we're doing business with, although sometimes to a corporation, we're, we're usually choosing a cause or advocating for a specific purpose. We might write to our elected officials about something that we're moved by. Um, and in that case, we're, we're going on public record. But what now would you feel strongly enough about that you would be willing to put your name to it and put it out there as Paul did and as so many other people have done throughout history in ways that a single letter might change the course of the world and the commentators that help us think about this book, which is really a letter written to that Roman community, will tell you that this single letter changed more lives than Plato's Republic. That more people thought about it, read it, and were changed by the words and the thoughts that Paul wrote down for that community than one of the greatest philosophers of our, of our human history. One letter. And so many of them were preserved and collected and they became not just his writing to a specific community and he thought of himself as, you know, a church builder and starter upper and a community builder and maybe a, a minister and a pastor who was helping people figure things out. I don't think that he he didn't even think of himself as starting a new religion per se. He always considered himself to be a faithful Jew. So he wasn't trying to write theology, but over time, because people held on to his letters and his words spoke to generation after generation, his letters were considered to be the revelation of God, that he had encountered God in the work that he did and they were held on to and they became more than just letters, they became scripture to us. And in that change, their context changed and how we understood them changed and we sort of froze those letters in time and we go back to them and we still sometimes look for solutions and I want to suggest that they're not perfect. Those letters had social engineering ideas inside them, but they might be the seeds of of great ideas and yet they aren't complete. They were the start of an idea but they were limited by the context in which he lived and practiced. He lived in Rome at a time when they were having a conservative movement and divorce which had been okay was no longer okay and the autonomy of women was being challenged and so although he often supported women's equality such as Phoebe carrying his letter as a deacon to from Corinth to Rome he had limits to what he would say because his communities were already in such peril from the Roman government that if he pushed too hard against the social norms that were being um, enforced from the emperor down, he might have imperiled his communities even more. We know that in his communities, there were both property owners and slaves, and he was asking them to call each other brother and sister. But I guess try to imagine that you are an indentured servant and all of your time is owned by someone else. And instead of saying, sir or ma'am, you walk up to him and slap him on the back and you say, George, how you doing, brother? I mean, he's asking for huge transformations, but at the same time, he did not undo the institution of slavery. It was part of the economy and the social structure of his day. He did not suggest that slaves should run away, but he was always working, I would think, towards emancipation and liberation in other ways. He frequently asked people that owned a slave to have the slave return to him as a worker in Christ, as a brother or a sister in Christ. 
but he didn't change complete institutions. So you can't look there for the, the whole answer because he didn't know it. He was figuring things out as he went. Every letter is him trying to figure something out real time. It wasn't a completely thought out, perfectly outlined, rational argument all the time. So just, just know that and know too that when you hear letters like the letter to Rome, he was writing to divided factions. Ro the Roman church was actually pretty healthy, but he wrote with part one chapter is written to the Gentiles, those who are not Jewish. He writes to them as people who had come out of other faith traditions and have chosen this tradition and to follow Christ. And then he writes to the Jews. And these letters are being read out loud. And he doesn't take a side. A lot of times people would write to him and his letters were in response when things were really critical and things were sort of falling apart. And people wanted to be right rather than righteous. They would choose to, I, I, I want to be the one that you side with and everybody else is wrong. And he would really talk about how you stay in community, not at the expense of somebody else. You heard him say, do not put a hindrance or a stumbling block in the way of others, but find ways for peace and communal upbuilding. He would speak to each constituent population in a community and he would ask them not to seek to be right but to be righteous to be faithful to listen to each other and to find unity unity that was strengthened by their diversity and he didn't he sometimes did some social engineering and gave them some suggestions but then as now it was a question of figuring it out we live in a pluralistic world and you can't look to Paul for all the answers about how that's going to happen. What you can look to Paul for is the understanding that the call of Christ is that ultimately we are all children of God. We are all heirs. We are all brothers and sisters. We are not higher or lower or not more or less valuable than each other. And that to create a society where each of us can claim to be that person who is equally valuable in the eyes of God we're responsible and accountable to each other for listening, for understanding and appreciating diversity, and going past being right to being righteous, to being loving and compassionate and listening and finding ways to build peace and build relationship together. When he couldn't be there to urge people to do it in his own person, when he couldn't send a delegate he sent a letter and it had to stand and it had to speak in dialogue with a whole complicated community that didn't have all the answers and he didn't either. So know that every letter that you read is a little messy. Sometimes they don't all line up perfectly. But his word was inspired and moved by the spirit of God. And we are called not to the detail necessarily of his letter, but to the spirit that asks us to build peace and to love each other. So let me take you on a funny little tour of the structure of the letters of Paul now, so that if, as we read and look at these different documents, you'll see that there are common elements. We're going to show a few images. So one person that can't see them. Uh, you're, you're looking right now at something you might have seen in high school. Did any of you have to take lessons on how to write a, a proper letter with the, the date and the, your address and then the greeting, the salutation, the body of the letter, a closing thought, a signature? If you look at the next image, you'll see that school children are still being taught how to do this. And these are a couple of funny illustrations that are used to show head, greeting, body, then they have the fists at the, at the waist for closing, and the signature, I guess they were doing something clever, you know, like something that's unique to you. They were teaching children how to write a letter, both by helping them remember with their body and then giving them illustrations of what a letter might look like. In the next image, you'll actually see extant fragments of old papyrus. These are copies 
of Paul's letter to the Romans, this one and the next one. Remember that Paul's letters are older than the four Gospels. The four Gospels were orally being handed down as documents. They weren't written down until later. So Paul's letters are the earliest documents of the New Testament. And in the next image, we're just going to quickly go through Romans. And I'm going to show you that it has these same features that we saw in the children's illustration. Paul introduces himself as the writer. He then names those who he is speaking to. And you'll find that this is repeated in virtually every letter that he created. And then he'll greet those recipients with something such as grace to you and peace. And in the next image, we'll see that he offers then a prayer and a blessing, which I'd already read for you this morning. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. And in the next image, you'll see that he reports what's been going on with him. And sometimes this will also be the reason that he's writing to you. It's, it's the occasion that causes him to write to a whole community. And in the next image, we'll see again that he, he repeats that. But I want you to note that he says, I, I may reap some harvest among you. Part of his purpose in writing the letter to the Romans is that he was taking up a collection from all the different churches to support the most impoverished church, which was the mother church in Jerusalem. He spent years of his ministry and many of the letters have some reference to taking up a collection for Jerusalem. And in the next image, you can see that he, he has a spiritual request in here where he asks people to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in our minds to the mind of Christ. But he also does have this agenda of hoping that the Roman church will support his mission first to Jerusalem and then on to Spain. And in the next image, we'll see the content that I shared with you, his suggestions of theology and social engineering. And then we'll come towards the closing in the next few images. He's going to send you greetings and farewells. And he started with Phoebe, the deacon, who carried the letter. And then he gives you all these different relationships. So you should also remember that Paul does not work in a vacuum. He was actually working often as a teacher. He had other followers. And this letter is written in the Greco-Roman practice of being a rhetorical, dialogical letter. And so it's actually written as if he were in a classroom and teaching and it has all of those components to it, but it was written in community and in relationships. So in his greetings in the next couple of images, you will see him talk about all the people he has a relationship with. And in the next image, you'll see him signing off. He even tells you the scribe, I Tertius, and Tertius is the scribe who wrote down Paul's words. And then he offers that final benediction, which frankly, is a little disturbing because the first line is the God of peace shall, will shortly crush Satan under your feet. And then he offers them the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm just going to offer you two more humorous. The first one, this is a cartoonist who sums up the letter in one sentence. Here's how I see it. After I drop this gift off at Jerusalem, I'd like to visit you on my way to Spain. Here's my calling card to chew on until then. And then the final image is an image by a painter who depicts Paul not as a man of action, but in his contemplative state when he is actually forced to write letters because he can't get there in person. Uh, please notice that Paul wrote on papyrus scripts that were rolled up. These were collected and eventually created a codex. What we see on his desk in this image is a bound book that didn't exist as such at the time, but was later compiled in that way into the book and became part of the canon of the Bible as we know it now. So taking away the images and looking at each other again, and I'm going to let us look at each other, I remind you, the focus of Paul is to remind us that we are a complex pluralistic community and that he didn't take sides. Instead, he asked not from us that we are right, but that we are righteous 
which means that we are in loving and respectful relationship with each other in our diversity. And we are asked to figure out what this means in our day and age, just as the community of Rome was asked to figure out what it meant in their day and age. We will be looking at the different letters and finding very wonderful treasures in them, but this is a quick overview of where that scripture came from and the common elements that you will see in all of those letters that were collected and written by Paul or for Paul. You are the heirs of God. You are the brothers and sisters of Christ. And the call that you are invited to make is the call not to father the God, but Abba, the one who loves you intimately. You are his children in this community. Thanks be to God. And now we're going to remind you with a visual prop. This is the wonderful collection basket that Joan Kolebniak had put together for us in the past. It says donations. And you can actually see the donations from this morning from the, the uh, earlier service. So we remind you that um, we had begun COVID by suggesting that people even have a little vase out or a little glass that you put your donation in each week until we can connect. You're always welcome to make an online donation or to mail in your contributions. They continue to be vital to the life of this church and this church in turn is vital to the life of our community. Um, we are alive and well. COVID never shut us down and it, we're open and we're still in business. So take your time to remember your commitment to this church that we may be a vital co partner and covenant partner with the world around us. So brothers and sisters, and I hope you hear that word with new meaning. It is a word that was not offered casually, but was given to you as a gift through the life of Christ, the ministry of those who followed, and the love of a holy God that truly claims you as the children of holy love. It is that time in our service when we turn to communion. And so... We begin with a prayer. We ask the Holy God to join us in this space. Oh, Holy God, the one that we call Abba, perhaps we call Ama, you who claim us as brother and sister and create a way for us. You remind us that all things are possible in you and through you, and that all that makes us unique comes from you, and that the diversity of this world is your gift. And it is a place of strength as well as challenge. And you are here with us in all of it. We ask you to be present in our disparate homes this morning as we gather our elements and our lives and our hearts and our minds and place all before you to be broken open and made holy all over again. Amen. Please join me in the invitation to communion. You'll find the words on your screen. Please stay unmuted if you would and read aloud the words of the people. Feel free to unmute. I'd love to hear your voices. God be with you. And also with you. 
Lift up your heart. We lift, we lift them up. up the sky. Let us give thanks to God most high. It, it is, is right. right. Thank Thank you. Give God. Us it is very meet, right in our bounden duty, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Feel free to mute yourselves. We have called down the presence of God among us. And so I invite you now to turn to the bread and the cup. We begin with the bread. And I remind you that the element of the bread represents and embodies the life of the one who came as human, as our first brother. And that life was broken open. His way was made available to all of us in that breaking and returning. And so today, brothers and sisters, as you take the wafer, the cracker, the cookie, whatever piece of food you have in your hand, let it embody for you the life of Christ, the way of holy love, broken open for you. And as you take need of it, do so in remembrance of him. brothers and sisters, by that same token, as you raise the cup, whatever you may have poured into it, know that what was poured out of the life of Christ was a love that transforms everything and overturns everything, a spirit that moves even now among all of us. And so as you lift that cup to your lips, do so in remembrance of that sacred love. Brothers and sisters, please join me again in the statement of thanksgiving that you'll find on your screens. And please again unmute yourselves so that you can read aloud with each other. Your voices, as we know from the letter of Paul, are important. We want to hear each other. We are not alone. God made us. We are not alone. We have each other. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can no, in all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through the one whose love for us has been proven. Neither death, nor life, neither neither what happens today, nor what happens tomorrow, 
Neither, Neither power, power, power from high, from high, high, nor power from the low, low, nor any Thanks be to God. Amen. And we are at that time in the service when we come to the benediction. I know that you had been singing without um, words or vocal accompaniment the last couple weeks, but we are going to offer you both voices and words again today. So please um, find on the screen your words. <laughs> Everybody, Alan's going to give us just a, a quick transition, and then we're going to open it up for conversation for a few minutes, and then have a fabulous send out by Alan. So I invite you to do speaker view too, so you can see each other and feel free to unmute yourselves and just say hello and chat for a few minutes over this Labor Day weekend. Uh, 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 